So for respiratory, we have this PowerPoint that has labels. I have found it to be better for your learning on this. If I go from the blank and fill it in, because it's a, this picture is a little complicated. I actually have to mark it up four or five times to get everything in it. Okay, but this sets the tone for the entire the entire uh, chapter. Oh, me too. Mine was silent though. Okay. Oh. Wow. Dr. Morris, why did you come in my room today? Okay, now it's going to work. What's that? The nose. The nose. Good, but don't put that on the test. Okay. That's where air moves into your body. Did you know we're really supposed to breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth? And there's a few reasons. We'll get to those in a second. This little opening, they're using that to show your nostrils. And we know the nostril is a structure that flares on the outside, but they cut the nose off, so they're just pointing to that hole. So let's call that nostril. By the way, in the old days in a &P, the old PowerPoints and stuff, they used to call it something different. They had a fancy name for it. You guys get lucky. They just call it what people call it now. Okay. But once we get in there, as you age, you'll find out you start to grow hair in that space. So inside the nostril, there's an open area when you first go in. We all wish that's where they took COVID tests. Oh no, they go further though. But that first little bitty open area, Right about here, it is called the nasal vestibule. That is where nose hairs grow. And a good thing for you guys, in two more chapters, we're going to learn about other vestibules in the body. And they are always open areas or spaces. Okay? So this nasal vestibule, here's how I say it. When you were a little kid and you used to pick your nose, that's where your fingers went. That is the nasal vestibule, okay? This next thing I'm gonna put here and then I'm gonna erase because it's not on the test. The reason it's not on the test is because I made the pools long ago when the, when the publisher's PowerPoints never labeled this structure. But it's very important to understand it. Up in there, that whole thing is your nasal cavity. You'll just notice it's never labeled on any of the pictures. Or is it? Is it on one of those? I might have to change my tune for the video, so I don't think it is. So it won't be on the test because they don't have it like that. They have it broken down into other areas, okay? The other thing, you know, sometimes people pierce the middle, not just the side. Sometimes they pierce the middle. What do they call the piercing in the middle? The septum, just like the heart, right? So there is a nasal septum here. Also not labeled in any picture, so I didn't put it in the pool, so I'm not going to put it up here for you tonight. But that's good knowledge to have moving forward. Okay. All right, I'm going to take that away now. Oh, I should have just done a slide. Now I have to do this. Okay. So what are those folds? Ooh. If you had Dr. Day for a class, I bet when you did the skull and you did bones, I bet he showed those bones. These top two are part of the ethmoid bone. The bottom one's its own bone. Oh, that's not the name we use anymore. There's, there's an alternate name. They're sometimes called turbinates, but more commonly here, they're called concha, the nasal concha. So we have three. Nasal concha. Now you can spell concha with an A or AE, singular or plural. I don't care which. Okay. But here's what I want you to know. The top one is this one right here. Guess what that S stands for? Superior. superior. So that is the superior nasal concha. This one, middle. Take a wild guess on the bottom. Inferior. Inferior. 
So the way I do the test is I ask you to name one of them. I point at one and you name it. You'll get most of your credit for nasal concha, but you also need to get whether it's superior, middle, or inferior for full credit. Okay. Neat thing here. Now, which side of the nose do you think you're looking at? Very good, right? That's the right side. Which side of the throat do you think you're looking at? Now I'm just messing with you because you got it correct. Watch this. This is crazy dissection. They cut all this, not down the middle, because if it was cut perfectly down the middle, you wouldn't see any of these concha because they're off on the right. Okay. So they cut the nose on the right. They cut this pretty much down the middle. That's why the uvula hangs so far. So when they cut, we're seeing into the left side of the throat. It's really weird like that, the way that they have, have kind of done this, okay? So I never ask, keep in mind, I don't ask right or wrong. Okay, so you don't, you don't have to, oh, sorry, wrong light. You don't have to worry about that right or wrong. Um, but what this means, this air that comes in, air that comes in on the right here, there's these big cavernous structures in there what that creates is this little area. Sorry, Jessica, let me use the pointer. That little area there, that little area there, and that little shaded area there, that's where the air flows. And when the air goes through there, it starts to swirl through the whole cavity on that side. And that's important because if we're breathing through our nose and air's coming in, it could be 30 degrees outside. Part of the job of all these passages is to warm that air up so it doesn't shock the lungs. Also, to humidify it. West Texas, our air is really dry. As it goes in, all these are mucous membranes. It swirls around, it picks up moisture. So it gets humid so it doesn't dry out the lungs. Pretty neat. And there's mucus up there so it's sticky so it filters if there's bad stuff. So we have these three folds and we also have three canals. Those three canals, each one is going to be called a nasal meatus. This one, this one, and this one. What do you think you're going to call that top blue line? Superior. What about the middle one? Middle, what about the bottom one? Inferior. So we have three nasal meatuses, a superior, a middle, and an inferior. So I may ask you to label one of those as well. Um, important for you to understand that has a purpose. Once again, it moves the air around, it helps it to warm up, it helps it to moisten, and it filters. To warm, to moisten, and to filter. Okay, now maybe, maybe in the NP1 you remember looking at the skull to learn the bones. Oh, by the way, those concha are part of the ethmoid bone. I will not be asking you that, but you might remember studying the ethmoid bone at one time. The top two concha are part of that. The bottom concha is its own little bone, actually. As air then moves through this nasal cavity on the right toward the back, these three are going to come together and form one opening. So you're going to get one opening, just like you have a nostril in the front. Or you remember looking at a skull, you have two big nose holes on the front. You have two big nose holes on the back as well. So air comes in through one hole. It spreads to three little canals, and it leaves through one hole in the back. So they name that, even though we don't see it. This right here. the posterior nasal aperture. It's like, you know, the opening in a camera is called an aperture where light gets in and they can change the size of that to change light. <laughs> they don't change the size. It doesn't change. It is what it is, but they called it that. I, I don't know why they did, but they did. I'm going to go put a, go ahead and put a mm, couple things on here just because they're easy. 
get them out of the way. This is your tongue. It looks massively huge because they cut it down the middle. And you know from looking under your tongue, there's a cord there and there's stuff under the tongue in the middle. So that's why it looks so big. If they cut it way over on the side, it would look a lot smaller. And then this, anybody remember what bone is the only bone in the body that does not form a joint? That one's up here. That's the one. Yeah, and it does. There you go. Anyway, that little bone right there, which we will see the whole bone in full view in another view. That, they've cut it. That's why it looks so small. It's shaped like a, excuse me, it's in your throat. And it's the only bone in the human body that does not form a joint with another bone. There's picture one. Next, I'm going to do the tonsils. Put a little black dot on each one. The one that's up high is in the top of the throat. And the AMP way to say throat is pharynx. I'll spell that for you in a little bit. So they call the tonsil up at the top. The pharyngeal tonsil, because it's in the pharynx. The tonsil at, on the tongue, it is right at the back of the tongue. You have one. It's way down. That's why we never see it. It is called the lingual tonsil. And so that just leaves the main tonsil. That's the one that when you say, ah, look in somebody's throat, you can see them if they have them off on the side. On the side there is by the palatine bones. So they call them the palatine tonsils. So there are our three tonsils. Where are the palatine bones? The palatine bones would be hidden. So they're on the sides. But the way they dissected here in the nose, we're seeing the right, but in the mouth, we're seeing the left. So it would kind of be here on the left, on the left side of that, going up and toward the front. Okay. So just a question. The lingual, is it just just tonsil? on the tongue? It's not tonsil. So it's tonsillar material. It's not necessarily as obvious as these. Yeah. This we'll call the hard palate because it's bony. And this right here we call the soft palate because it's muscle and connective tissue. And then this part of the soft palate that hangs down right there. That's the uvula. We will see the uvula better when we do digestive next time on Thursday. Also, we'll see the palate better when we do digestive. We'll have a picture of the open mouth. So that'll be, and respiratory and digestive are on the same testing period. So it's kind of nice to cover this. We spend a lot of time on this picture this time. That lets us go faster on it when we do it in digestive next time. Okay, that, um, one more thing, yeah. Right here, going to the ear, there's an opening that goes up to the ear, so your ear can drain fluid. That's why sometimes if you have an earache, a day or two later, you might have a sore throat, or sometimes you have a sore throat and you end up with the earache, because there's a tube that goes from the top of the throat to the ear. Well, that is the opening of the tube. So right there is the opening of the tube. For me, you don't have to call it the opening. I'm just going to ask you what that structure is. 
and I want you to tell me what the name of the tube is. It has a bunch of names. I'm only going to teach you two. There's another one that your PowerPoint does that's longer, but these are the two that I like. And honestly, they're the two that are more commonly used in medicine. Auditory tube, that's easy because it goes to the ear. If you want to put that on the test all day long, you can. That'll be fun. But in ear, nose, and throat specialists, if you have to go get tubes in your ears or if you're, you go to that kind of doctor for anything, they more commonly call this the eustachian tube. You may have even heard that before. And it just so works out that the eustachian tubes, that spelling starts with the an E, and that tube has a layer of elastic cartilage all around it. So it's a highly flexible, but yet pretty solid tube that helps to keep it open. We know it can close. We know when you're on an airplane, you might pull and try to pop it or whatever, but um, it does have elastic cartilage. And the reason I point that out is because this thing right here that we're about to talk about, it's also elastic cartilage. And I'll do that on the next screen. Okay. So if you want to go ahead and capture this. Anytime you guys want to slow me down tonight, you can. So if something doesn't make sense, just stop me. probably noticed that in the back of the throat, they've color coded it. They use three colors to show us the throat. So those are the three regions of the pharynx. You notice it sounds funny when I say it. Um, in Texas, people usually say pharynx, but it's pharynx. I had a teacher who was a colleague and he was big on, look how it ends, Y N X, like that little animal, the lynx. So it's inks. The funny thing is, right here, this is your voice box. It is your larynx, Y N X, right? Commonly called the voice box. Voice box is not a testable, correct answer. All right. I'll probably give you one if you put voice box. So don't put voice box. Three parts of the pharynx, the pre three parts or regions of the throat are named after what they're behind. So the red one is behind the nose. Naso. Pharynx. The blue one, what's it behind? Okay. Um, generic, more generic than that. How about the mouth? So they call that blue region the oropharynx. And you know what? They don't give me a good green, so I'm going to use this. This is your larynx, right? Your voice box. So this green one is behind the larynx, so they call it. And this is the way that it works. Anytime a word has an X in it and you need to combo it with another word to make a big word, they change it to that. So they say laryngeo instead of larynch. Oh, it would just be hard to do. Laryngeo pharynx. So one, two, three regions of the throat. <clears throat> Commonly, one of those will be asked on the test.
which tonsils look like they're mostly in the oropharynx? Palatine. Palatine. What else? What's the one on the back of the tongue? Yeah, the lingual. Which tonsils in the nasopharynx? Pharyngeal. That's how they see they do it, kind of like we do laryngeo. They change the ending. So pharyngeal. Which bone is the only bone that does not articulate with another bone? Hyoid. Hyoid bone. Cool. Hyoid. Yeah, there's no way a lot of people do that. Okay. Next. If you want that picture with larynx, get it, because I'm about to take larynx away. I'll leave this stuff on the back side, and I'm going to show you the parts of that. Actually, you know what? I'll probably just take all this away and start over, because I want to zoom it up. So when we get our tonsils removed, they only remove one? Oh, good point. Great question. Watch this. It depends. So when you get your tonsils out, the most common tonsils to remove are these, yeah. right? The palatine tonsils. But nowadays, these are getting bigger and bigger. And they can be so big, they kind of block some of this passageway. So they might remove those as well. So that reminds me, I should probably tell you, those have another name. Have you ever heard they take your tonsils and your, those are your adenoids. Your, your tonsils up there, the pharyngeal tonsils are also called adenoids. A D E A D E N O I D S. So it's adenoids, like adenohypothesis. It means gland like. Adenoids just means gland like. Oh, these things are gland like. They're tonsils. Why don't we call them that? I don't know. So it makes people think that they're taking out your tonsils in something else. It's really just two sets of tonsils. Okay, so back to this. Aha, this is good. This blue structure is very important. This thing allows you to breathe through the same area as you might drink. We can breathe air through our mouth, and it doesn't go to the wrong place. Wow, that's cool. We can breathe air in here, and it comes in here because this thing is open. So we'll do blue for air. There's your air going that away. Here we'll do this for food. Here's your food. Look what your food does. It stays there. What keeps your food from moving forward? That flap. That flap prevents your food from moving into your lungs. So that flap is very special. And that flap has a name. It is the epiglottis. And it, just like this, happens to be elastic cartilage. So by the way, there's basically three things in the body that are elastic cartilage. I don't know if you got this when you're in AMT1 or not, but it's this, it's this, and watch this. If I sleep funny tonight, like this, and I'll hold my ear like that the whole night, what happens when I wake up? It hurts, but it snaps right back, yeah. right? Snaps right back because it's elastic cartilage, and that's what elastic cartilage does. So your station tube, epiglottis, and your ear are elastic cartilage. And remember, just like eosinophil, there's three of them. And they all happen to have a name that starts with E, 
that makes it real easy to remember. Probably going to show up in the lecture too, something like that. Okay, back to our voice box. Get rid of some of those dots, they get confusing. So back to the voice box. These cartilage structures, all of these little blue things are cartilage everywhere that they show little, yeah, that's about it. These little blue guys are cartilage. This one right here in the front, because it's close to the thyroid, we call it the thyroid cartilage. It is protecting, it is, it is forming your voice box. It is one of the major cartilages of your voice box or larynx. The one right below it here on the back side, it's pretty big. On the front side, it's really little. And notice how it connects like right through there. So this thing, they've sliced it. It's a ring. We're going to see a picture that shows that better later tonight. But that's a ring below the thyroid cartilage. Its key feature is that it's thick in the back and thin in the front. So that makes it easy to identify. It is called the cricoid cartilage. And then the tube. As it continues here, right here, anything below that cricoid is actually your trachea. And back here, everything below the green area, this is now your esophagus. And just because it's the hardest one up there, I'm going to go ahead and remind you. That is the laryngopharynx. The laryngopharynx. Below that, it becomes the esophagus. Below the voice box, it becomes the trachea, specifically after it crosses the cricoid. We will see good pictures of the voice box in a little bit to, to learn these structures um, a little better. So that, um, I'll point out, these are your vocal cords. I would never ask them on this picture. Sorry, I forget to use a pointer. Because you can't tell which is which because it's a dissection. We have a great picture that has all the vocal cords intact. If I ever want to ask them, I'll ask it on that. Okay, so now if you want to get that, you can get it. And I think we're finished with this picture. So it took a while to get through. Um, notice this has the stuff, a lot of the stuff labeled. So using these, going to the labeled ones is good. I just don't do that with you in our lab tonight. I would not add anything on the test that I didn't cover with you, though. So if there's something on there that we didn't cover, it wouldn't show up. Like, if you can see this, even as tiny as it is, is, isthmus. Nope, not on there. Vestibular and vocal folds. Nope, not on there. We didn't cover them. The only things that would be on there, look. Oh, the meatuses, superior, middle, inferior. Oh, the concha. They spell it with the other spelling, the A-E spelling, and that's okay. So you'll notice all our stuff is there. So this is a great picture. If you want it in your, in your phone to study from, you can snag it, but you don't have to get it. Uh, what's better about this picture is they actually show us that we have stuff behind the spine. I didn't point it out to you, but that other picture, it just kind of stopped. It looked like there was nothing behind that person's throat at all, which was kind of weird. Where do nose hairs grow? In what region? Vestibule. Very good, the vestibule, the vestibule. Okay, so let's zoom this up. 
a little, not too much. There we go. So this is your voice box, basically. It includes some of the trachea as well, from the side and from the front. Now, when we shifted to eight weeks, and as we've done eight weeks more, we've we've made some decisions as to some things we won't teach as much and won't do in lab. They may be hinted at in lecture, but one of the things is the cartilages of the voice box. So I will use this highlighter. Well, we already did the cricoid. We're going to keep that. Here it is, right? Big in the back, small in the front. But look at it over here. Oh, and right here, and it gets bigger as you go back. So there's the cricoid. Of it, remember this was the thyroid cartilage right here? But look, this is a much better picture of the thyroid. Look at that big thing. It goes all the way down like that. That's the major cartilage there called the thyroid cartilage. And you probably know sometimes guys have a pointy throat right here, a little pointier than girls most of the time. One reason, it's pretty simple. Testosterone causes cartilage to grow more. And as the cartilage grows more, that sticks out. So they gave it a name. They call it the dominance or the Adam's apple. Okay. It's not Going up higher, we see the little piece of the hyoid bone that they were showing us cut right there. But look, I like this because you see the whole hyoid right there. It's kind of U-shaped. You guys do not need to tell me that's the body of the hyoid if it's pointed at. Just tell me it's the hyoid bone. Only bone in the body that what? Isn't connected to another bone. So please, please note, it is connected. To just not bones. It just doesn't join bones. Okay, here's your epiglottis. Elastic cartilage in the center, got some epithelium outside of that. Here it is over here, just sticking up. Now, if you're an adult and you say, ah, and somebody's looking in your throat, odds are they're never going to see your epiglottis. It's too far back there. You can push your finger back there far enough if you choke and go, you might feel your epiglottis hit your finger if you do that, but usually you'll never see it. In little kids, because their epiglottis is still pretty big, especially if they have a sore throat or an infection, you might look there and see that at some sometimes. Just depends on the kid. These down here are the tracheal cartilages. Now they look like they look like circles here, but they're not. They go back and they stop. So they're shaped like that. If we look at it over here, they would come around, right? But they don't go all the way back. To me, that shape is a U. Nope. I call them C rings. I don't know why, but they do. So. Those, you are more than welcome all day long on the test to call them C-rings. You can say tracheal cartilage if you're asked or C-ring. Both are correct. All the cartilage up here except the epiglottis is the other kind of cartilage, the most common cartilage in the body. From AMP1 for 20 points. Yeah, hyaline cartilage. The only one up here that's not hyaline is the epiglottis. It's elastic. Remember, we gave the memory device E for elastic and epiglottis. Rib cartilage, nose cartilage, knee cartilage, hyaline cartilage. Um, there is a special pad in your knee that's different, and your spine has different cartilage for the discs. That's called fibro. So tonight we'll see a couple of slides. We'll actually see three. 
we'll see hyaline cartilage. We're going to see a trachea that's also going to have some epithelium, and then we're going to see a lung. So we'll go through those. They are very simple compared to the slides we've done in the past. All right. What organ does that make this right here? Trachea. There you go. Trachea. That's the trachea right there. I just wanted to point it out. Up above, it's the voice box. That's the trachea. Um, these are the ones. I don't want to cross them out. Oh, I went too far. But we don't do those. You won't be asked those on the test. Okay. Or the other stuff on the front, except for one thing. There's one more thing I want you to have, and that's this right here if you look right here between the cricoid and the thyroid cartilage there's a space watch this i put the blue dot there you can find it on your throat if you go up from here you'll feel one ring that feels strong and sticks out and then there's a gap like right there you can push in and fill that is that space between these this and this cartilage right there you ever watched a medical drama and somebody's choking and passed out and they take a pin, they cut them and put the pin in and now they breathe and live? That's where they go right there. Really could happen. Okay, that's why it's in all the shows. That could really happen. Could the person mess up and kill them? Sure they could. But they're not so likely to. Here's why. If you know where to go, it's real easy to cut through that tissue because it's not cartilage. Cartilage is hard. If you tried to cut through the cartilage, by the time you push hard enough to go through the cartilage, you're going through their neck, their whole neck. They're gone. But you go right here, you got a sharp, you just push right through that little ligament. You go in and it opens up a passageway for air and now they can breathe and they can survive. So pretty cool. So I do want you to know the name of those ligaments. It makes sense. Cricothyroid because they go from the cricoid to the thyroid cartilage. And that's it for this whole picture. Just what we marked up and talked about. Notice, once again, these are not good pictures of the vocal cords. That is why I skipped them. We will see them in a picture in a minute. Oh, that's so good. If they're croaking, cut the crico. I love it. Yes, that was Margarita coming up with <laughs> a great memory device. Okay, this one. I'm not going to use this for any of the top stuff, so I'll blow it up a little because we already did all that. Notice there's the cricoid, skinny in the front, thick in the back. So what's that make all of this? What what organ? Trachea. And what are these little things? There you go. I almost said rings. <laughs> yeah, those are C rings. Okay, so I'm gonna get it to right there. Wow. What is this muscle? That is the diaphragm. Everybody check that out for a second. Notice how the diaphragm, come on little mouse, it goes, it wraps down, goes in. Oh, sorry, this in the blank was actually slide two. In the blank, if you have the same blank as me. No, I skipped it earlier and I went back to it. So it's the, it's higher up. It was the second slide I had on the blank. No, my paper stopped. Oh, okay. So they're all out of order. But I like to show you how it goes in and it attaches to the back side of your abdomen. And then it, if they didn't cut it, it would come forward and attach to the front of your gut. So it makes a dome. But that's not why we're doing this. Digestive is, or sorry, we'll see it better in digestive when we go into the guts. But it is a breathing muscle. 
Does anybody know what kind of muscle it is? The diaphragm? Yeah. So that's not a type, but that's very good. What are our three types from AP1? Skeletal. Skeletal. Cardiac. What's the tube muscle? I couldn't hear you on your mic. Smooth, smooth, yeah. It's smooth. So there's skeletal, cardiac, and smooth, right? Well, cardiac's only one place. Where is it, Natalia? Cardiac, only one place. It's in the heart. That's it. Nowhere else. As soon as you leave the heart and you go on blood vessels, different muscles, smooth muscle. So what do you think the diaphragm is? How many vote smooth? How many vote cardiac? I better see no cardiac. How many smooth? How many cardiacs? How many skeletals, Hannah? Can we do both? <laughs> so check this out, Margarita, you're on the right track. Although voluntary is not a type. Mm -hmm. Breathing is usually subconscious. We don't have to think about it. But at any time you want, you can override it. You cannot control ever heart muscle or smooth muscle. It's always involuntary. Mm -hmm. So it has to be skeletal. So it is a, and, and that, that is one of those neat things that I love people from AMP2 to know, right? Because that's cool. It's unexpected. Most people say smooth. That's the norm because you know, oh, breathing is not conscious. I don't have to think to breathe. So obviously it's got to be the subconscious muscle, but it's not. The reason is your brain can create reflexes that control skeletal muscles. So normally it operates in the background, the brain controlling it through reflexes, which is super cool. Okay, enough of that. Do you guys remember the name of the space? I'm going to highlight it and then take the highlight away. I just want you to see what I mean. What is that space all the way between the lungs from top to bottom called? Here's its name. I'm going to write it up here. Here's how we pronounce it, mediastinum, mediastinum. Some people still say mediastinum, Me, right? And so no worries. The mediastinum is the space between what? Between the lungs. Very good. Space between the lungs. Right on. What organ is in the mediastinum? Heart. What organ that we see is in the mediastinum? Natalia, what's that thing? Right here. It's your word of the day. Trachea. Trachea. There you go. So trachea. Now, here's what's cool. All of these rings are called the what rings? C rings. And what kind of tissue are they? Highland cartilage. Good. They're highland cartilage, right? Does this little bottom one look like a C to you? No. What's it look like? A diaper. Very good. It does. It looks like a little kid's pair of underwear, little kid's underwear, little baby, right? Here's why. The trachea splits. Obviously, when it splits, they got to rename it. They don't call it the trachea anymore. It becomes something else that goes into the lungs. But this has to wrap under it to protect it. So since it's a different cartilage, they gave it a name. Carina. If you have a friend named Carina, this is a different pronunciation. That's the Carina. It is the lowest tracheal cartilage. All the others are C rings, not this one. You may already know your lungs have lobes. You've probably heard that. I love to do this just like we did the heart picture on day one with the valves. 
and other things. Look here, the right lung, how many motions to do that are? Three, superior, middle, inferior, low. Over here, left, superior, inferior, only. Two lobes, three lobes on the right, two lobes on the left. This little place right here where the heart would fit, that's where the middle lobe would be. It's not there. And there's a little group to give it a name. What kind of notch do you think? Cardiac, because it's where the heart goes. Cardiac notch. That's that little, where I put that little blue squiggle. That's the cardiac notch. It's part of the lung. It's a groove on the lung. Ah, I think. Oh, good. Two, two more. Really, it's three more things, four more things, but it's a couple of things. Right here, what do we call the point on an organ? Very good. So that's the apex of both lungs. And then the last thing for this picture, those grooves you see on the lung that divides the lobes. Those are not just lines. They're actual grooves. You could take your fingers. Don't do this at home, but you could push it up in there. Okay? Not from the outside, obviously, but if you're in the chest cavity. So don't be killing anybody tonight with a knife and checking out this. These are called fissures because they are very deep grooves. Mm -hmm. So like the longitudinal fissure in the brain, this, these fissures have names. This one goes at a deep angle, and so does this one. So both of these, oblique. Now, this one here is more straight across. It's not straight across, but it's more straight across. So they say that's horizontal. We call it the horizontal. Remember, it's a deep groove, not just a line or not just a shallow groove. It's deep. It goes, it really separates the lungs. And that's it for this picture. I'll show you the labeled version of this in a minute. This is the better picture, though, so I'm going to start with it. This picture, can you see a tongue up there? Is the tongue at the top or the bottom? The top. By the way, I know it looks like the tip of your tongue. That is not. That is the back of your tongue all the way in the throat. So that means this person's laying on their back. Their mouth would be way up there and their head would be laying back here. So up is front. Okay. Kind of crazy, but up this, let's do it this way. Anterior, posterior. They're looking down into the voice box or larynx. And so we need to identify some structures. Here, tell me what you think it is by what letter I put on it. Epiglottis. There you go. <laughs> that is the epiglottis. Now, we just memorized a weird word, epiglottis. I've just been calling it the epiglottis. I never even told you. Its name means something. Epi always means upon or above or around. They, they can use it different. If we look here, the two dots, are your true vocal cords. They look different than all the tissue around them. They are tight little cords that produce sound. 
They are called true because they make your sound. They give you your voice. I'm going to use two blue dots on these that look similar but a different color to sign them. These are folds. They help with the quality of the sound and direct air, but they don't actually produce the sound, right? Because, because of the way that they're in there. So true vocal cords that make the sound. And you can see a nice space between those true vocal cords where air could move, right? Now, what I'm going to tell you is you can close that space and make it disappear and you can open it up. But that space, and I'll use a, a third color, across here, notice it includes the true vocal cords, but the space spanning across there is called <coughs> aha, the glottis. That is that opening or space. How many names for a space do they have in AMP? Oh my goodness, it's crazy. I can't even think of how many they have. But here's a new one, a glottis. Okay. So therefore, that now you know the epiglottis that sits right here that covers that, it covers that opening when you swallow. So that is why they call it the epiglottis. Okay. Because it's upon the glottis. And just to reiterate, so you know we're really looking forward here. What are those little things there? Those are the C-rings in the trachea. You can actually see the... I wrote it like this last night, yesterday. Somebody said, Krings? What are those? I was like, oops, no, those, that's C-ring. Sorry about that. You don't have to hyphenate it. So there you go. That is the voice box. This whole thing, yeah, you're looking down into the voice box. So these are some of those other cartilages that we didn't do, and we're not going to worry about it. Well, yeah. Just leave it at that. Here's a picture that shows more. Okay. I like our picture because it's brighter. We can see the C rings you can't hear. But this has the true and false vocal cords, the glottis and the epiglottis and the tongue. And then they didn't label the C-rings, but we did. They just said inside the trachea. And then they did the corniculate cartilage, which I told you all you didn't need. Okay. But what I, why I show this side, this other side that we haven't seen, is so you can see the glottis closes. You're going to learn, when you get in a healthcare program, you're going to learn about orthopedic tests. And one orthopedic test that you may ask a patient to do someday is you might say, bear down like you're trying to have a forceful bowel movement. So they're going to go like that. And you know, when they're really doing that, if you're doing that for real, you're not grunting and making noise. Well, maybe you're grunting, but you're not, you're not letting, you're not doing that. You're pressurizing the cavity. See this closes when you go for real, it closes the glottis and you build up air pressure in your chest cavity and that pushes down into your abdomen and that helps somebody go to the bathroom if things aren't working so well okay why they do it as an orthopedic test is not for that it also pressurizes your spinal column and if you have a disc that is herniated it can cause referral pain down the disc when you do that because it squeezes where those nerves are okay so that's what it's for you don't need to know it but anyway that's why sometimes this is closed, but we have to close it. Usually it's open. Okay. All right. Um, we'll do this picture and then we'll do two slides 
and then we'll take our break. Here's cilia. This is what cilia in your trachea would look like. I want to make sure and point out that cilia, even though they look like hair, they absolutely positively are not hair. I know sometimes in AMP1 they say hair like, and by the time you get after time, you forget the like, and you're like, oh, there's little hairs in there. Nope, absolutely not. They're not hair, they're completely different. Here, what do you think this shape is? That's a C, not a U. I know it looks like a U. That is a C ring right there. So that means we're looking at the trachea. Look, here's a lumen. And that means this little red line here is the epithelium, the lining or the mucous membrane of the trachea. But now we want to remember what we learned in AMP1, and that was this. The epithelium that lines the inside of the trachea is very special. It has the biggest, baddest name of all the epithelium. It is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Okay, so I am going to draw for you just a few little cilia for fun so that when you look at this, you'll remember, oh yeah, that's the direction the cilia point. By the way, they're not that big. They don't get in the way of anything. You can see how microscopic they are by looking over there. Okay, what do the cilia do? They do this. They're, here's the lumen, they're all around. They contract and push up. And they push the mucus and whatever's trapped in the mucus. And then they relax and go down and grab some more and push it up. So cilia are constantly vibrating and moving and grabbing mucus. And moving it up in your throat and you do this, gulp, six to eight times a minute subconsciously we swallow. We're swallowing mucus, it's coming from our lungs, I know it sounds gross. Right now you're probably not, right now you're probably not swallowing and your saliva is building up and the mucus is building up and it's going to be funny because in about a minute or so you're not going to be able to hold it any longer and you're going to go and you're going to swallow so loud that your neighbor hears you. I'm just telling you, because it's what we do. When we start talking about these subconscious things and we monitor them, we control them, and then we can't anymore. We just have to let it happen. So the reason we do that is because the stomach has acid, and it's the perfect place to kill any bacteria and any funk that's getting pushed up. So that's nature's way of taking care of it, because the stomach is acidic. That's why long term it can re be really bad to take antacids. Acid is there for a reason. But of course, if you have terrible heart earn, that pain is so terrible, you really don't care. You just want to get it to stop. So vicious cycle with some things. Also notice, because the C-rings don't meet in the back, that's the perfect location to span a little muscle across. That's a muscle of the trachea. Look what they call it, tracheallus muscle, okay? The tracheallus muscle. So you get to choose what kind of muscle is that. Is it cardiac? Why can it not be cardiac? Yeah, cardiac's only in the heart. So you got a choice. Let me ask you right now. You ready, Sean? Contract your trachea. Can't do it. So it has to be smooth. It is smooth. It is smooth muscle. Did you try to contract your trachea, Hannah? You're like, all right, contract my trachea. I don't know. <laughs> Can't do it. All right. Lumen, epithelium, the cartilage. What kind of cartilage, by the way, is a C-ring? Babe's favorite. Hyaline cartilage. So, hey Jenna, if I was going to label this space, what would I call it? There we go. You might have been AMP1. I don't know how Dr. Bolton, didn't you have Dr. Bolton? 
he might have called it a free space if you did in the epithelium. They usually have a basement membrane and a free surface or free space. But it just so happens when we're in the body, that's commonly a wound. So, but it could be called a free surface too. The basement membrane would be right about here, right at the bottom of those cells. And this is the rule breaker. I'm going to show you on the next slide, the next picture we do. I'm going to show you why it's called pseudo stratified, but I'll just tell you here. See how you see a lot of nuclei stacked? You might remember squamous are flat, cuboidal are bigger, columnar are bigger. And then we have one layer is called simple and multi layers called stratified. That looks, if I didn't know better, I'd say that's multi layered. But here's what they did. They went in and investigated this, and they found out that there's a layer of really short cells, a layer of taller cells, and a layer of even taller cells. And the funny thing is that all of those cells touch the bottom. They're just different heights. So it's not stratified. It's really just one layer of different shaped cells. So it's one layer. So they said, ah. It looks like it's multi-layered. Let's call it falsely stratified. Pseudo means fake. It's like, not really, haha, -ha, it's a joke. It's not stratified. So that's what that means, and that's why that's that. And yes, right here, what are these? Yeah. There's your little cilia. And this is, oh, let me see if I can get her. P. Does that show up good for you or not? Yes. Okay. C, C, E. That's it right there. So now it's ready. Um, no, let me let me highlight just to make sure what you might need. Oh, that's the esophagus behind it, by the way. And did I erase my creams? Why is it not here? That was on the other one. So let's put C ring just in case. So that's the stuff that you would need to know. Not this. That's why I left it off over here. So let's look at both the pseudo stratified slide and the highland cartilage slide, and then we'll take our break. Highland cartilage first. So this is the kind of cartilage that you might see in the trachea and you would see in other places. This is a, to me, this is one of the best all time pictures of cartilage. It's great. It was a gorgeous slide we had, um, looked good. And so we got pictures of it. Anybody remember what the name of cartilage cells are? Here's a good one. Chondrocytes. They are called chondrocytes. Now, it is those chondrocytes in their previous life before they matured, they built the cartilage. So they used to be called chondroblasts. Oh, how cool is that? Mm -hmm. They were chondroblasts building the cartilage. And then when they finished with the cartilage, they kind of chilled out and they call them chondrocytes. Well, funny thing, cartilage happens to be this. Remind me what avascular means. No blood flow, no direct blood supply. There's no blood in cartilage. Most tissues have good blood supply, not cartilage. So cartilage is tough, right? I mean, if you've ever eaten chicken wings, there's cartilage on chicken wings. There's cartilage on drumsticks. Sorry to gross you out. Some people love to get to the end of the bone and pop it in the mouth and just chew, 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 chew. But it's hard. 
you could bite through it, but you would have to, you know. So here's the point of saying all that. Cartilage is so dense and it has no blood supply. So when you damage it, it takes a long time to heal because it's hard for the for it to get enough nutrients and stuff from the blood to get there. But these cells have to be alive and they need oxygen. So on a daily basis, here's what happens. The cells, when they built the cartilage, they hollowed out these spaces for the cells to live in. So sometimes it's a group of cells, sometimes it's one cell, but they have these hollow spaces that they live in. It's one of my favorite names in all of AMP. Lacuna methoda. Oh, sorry, I couldn't help it. So, lacuna, these little lagoons that hold nutrients to keep the cells alive. See, what happens is the nutrients diffuse from the blood all the way across the tissues, but because it takes so long for them to get there, we build a little pool around the cells so they can accumulate enough to stay alive. It's really neat. So lacuna are always, always, always a space. Within that, the cells are the chondrocytes. And this is your hyaline cartilage. By the way, the pink stuff in the background, they might call that the matrix, and they might say it's collagen and other stuff. I'm not going to ask you anything about that. That was a MP1 cell. Okay. But it is stuff. That's it for cartilage, hyaline cartilage. I'm not going to show you elastic or fibro on the test. Hopefully that makes it easier. And by the way, even before eight weeks, we never did the other types in this lab. We just did this one. And then here, here's a pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Much better details than the other one. Here is your little cute little basement membrane. I won't ask you to label it on the test, but I want to put that there so you see where the where the uh, connective tissue below becomes the epithelium here. These, aha, what are these little cuties? Yeah, I knew somebody would remember. Those are goblet cells. And what do those goblet cells secrete? Mucus. Mucus. Yep. And we have a slide that we'll see on Thursday in the gut, because goblet cells are also in the gut, not just in the, in the trachea here. Uh, we'll actually see the mucus coming out. It's not clear and yucky. Like, I mean, it's, it's yeah, it won't look gross. Remind me what these little guys are. Those are. Hey, and Jenna, what's this space? There you go. Yeah, one L. C-I-L-I-A. And my granddaughter's name is Cecilia. There you go. Of course, she doesn't spell it like that either. Oh, I better write the biggest, longest name up there. What's this tissue type called from here to here? Give me the abbreviation. And the P stands for pseudo. Oops. Pseudo stratified, ciliated, and the top. Here's the funny thing there's a short cell, little Q. There's another one and another one. There's a cell right there. And look, these tall ones back here, they go behind those and touch the bottom too. Bless you. So, once again, they're mall, they look like multi layered but they all come down and touch the basement membrane. So it's really only one layer. When it's like that, they pick the tallest cells to name it for. 
or this is the way they say it. The cells that reach the free surface, we name it for those cells. So the only cells that reach the free surface are the columnar cells. So they call it columnar. There we go. Pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Ah, oh, where's this? What organ? There you go. Trachea. Oh, basement membrane. It, the basement membrane won't be on the test, though. Okay. Neither will free surface. Lumen, you might get lucky and get a lumen. I doubt it. I'm going to say that I told a little lie. Let's do this since we already did it. I can get through it real quick. It'll get us a little further. Okay. I'll look up there. Trachea, right? We already know that. Look, lobes, superior, middle, inferior, superior, inferior. What are these deep grooves called? Fissures. This one is oblique fissure. This one is oblique fissure. What's this one? Horizontal. What's this notch? Like how I helped you there? Cardiac notch. Okay. What's the space all the way through here? Mediastinum. Now, I say mediastinum, but that's the easy way to spell it. Um, what's this part of the lung? Apex. apex. Very good. Oh, what I didn't tell you? If that's the apex, you could call this the base. Base isn't on the test, though. Okay. Never has been. I don't know why. Just never made it. What was this little diaper? Carina. 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 Yeah. So here's why I put this up here. For these three things that weren't on the other picture. The primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, and tertiary bronchi. Those are the tubes. As the tubes, watch how I mark them up for you. As the tubes come into the lungs here, the trachea splits, right? And at the split, the first branch is called primary. So sometimes we abbreviate primary like that, like first degree or primary. So it's the primary bronchus, or both of them are primary bronchi, B-R-O-N-C-H-I. I remember, I don't care if you use singular or plural. So you can end it with a U-S or an I. After that, if, so if you look to right here, then it would split. And you see how it splits? Watch this. I'll change colors. And it goes here. And it goes to those. Like that. Okay. Each of those next branches are called secondary bronchi. Well, then you'll notice that those secondaries at some point, they split. And whenever the next branches split, they call them tertiary. Now I will tell you, they did a terrible job on this picture of showing how they split. That's why I draw it in, okay? So maybe that tells you something. This picture's not so great for getting the secondary and the tertiary because it's not consistent. But the concept, let me write something else before you get that because I, I want you guys to see this. Um, there are actually 16 of those branches. So like we did the first branch, the second branch, the third branches, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 16 generations. And here's what that, let me blow your mind here. There's two there. And they don't all just have two branches after that. Some can have more than that. It very quickly adds up and they very quickly get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. 
at some point they get so small that if we were to look at them, we probably couldn't even see the tubes with the naked eye. They get that small. That's crazy. And so after that, we get seven more whole generations of branches, and they call those, most of them, bronchioles. Anytime they put O-L-E, they mean tiny or little. So here's what I, after the trachea, once we get in the lungs, there's 23 groups of branching that happens before we get to the little air sacs. And so that's where we'll begin after our break, is we'll begin at the little tiny air sacs. And I'll go back and show you some of these as well. But that's a whole lot of generations of branches. Man, is it ever. It's a crazy number. <laughs> 